The second story in the Gwendy trilogy, Gwendy's Magic Feather, contains a number of Stephen King hallmarks, references, and Castle Rock callbacks. However, unlike Gwendy's Button Box, King didn't co-write this story, and rather it was Richard Chismar that penned this particular tale. But despite King's absence as an author, his established lore and iconography are influential and instrumental to this, Chismar's solo effort navigating within King's Castle Rock canon. Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is a great undertaking. Gwendy's Button Box was a collaborative effort that began when Stephen King mused over a more modern retelling of Pandora and her box from which all hell would be unleashed. Chismar helped King to resolve the story, but ultimately, Chismar felt that there was more of Gwendy's story and the story of the Button Box that needed to be told. And so, with King's blessing and only the vaguest idea just where the story would lead, Chismar set out to determine just where the story would take him. Gwendy's Magic Feather A Brief Summary Something evil has swept into the small main town of Castle Rock on the heels of the latest winter storm. Sheriff Norris Ridgewick and his team are desperately searching for two missing girls, but time is running out. In Washington, D.C., 37-year-old Wendy Peterson couldn't be more different from the self-conscious teenaged girl who once spent a summer running up Castle Rock's suicide stairs. That same summer, she had been entrusted, or some might say cursed, with the extraordinary button box by Richard Ferris, the mysterious stranger in the black suit. The seductive and powerful box offered Wendy Gwendy shit. The seductive and powerful box offered Gwendy small gifts in exchange for its care and feeding until Ferris eventually returned, promising the young girl she'd never see the box again. One day, though, the button box suddenly reappears, but this time without Richard Ferris to explain why or what she's supposed to do with it. Between this and the troubling disappearances back in Castle Rock, Gwendy decides to return home. She just might be able to help rescue the missing girls and stop a dangerous madman before he does something ghastly. History and Background I've already covered a great deal of how the collaboration of King and Chismar came to be in my video for Gwendy's Button Box, so Check that out for a more in-depth explanation of how the two came to work together. In a YouTube video posted by Chismar in 2019, he claims that he sent Gwendy's Magic Feather off to three different editors prior to publication, one of which was Stephen King, and that prior to sending the manuscript off for the editing process, he, quote, knew there was a lot of work left to do, unquote. And it's not clear that Beyond continuity and grammar edits, King and the other editors truly helped Chismar to finish the work he admitted needed to be done. <sighs> when this book was published in 2019, there were some valid criticisms being levied against it. Some booktubers called it a cash grab by Chismar. Some critics said it felt like a cobbled together fan fiction. Others called it a blatant fan service aimed at constant readers and more still took issue with the pacing of the story. And, well, I'm not going to argue against any of these criticisms. In fact, I'm going to levy a few of my own and we'll get to those in just a moment. Anyway, outside of the three-minute video Chismar shared on YouTube, there isn't much information about the background or inspiration for Gwendy's Magic Feather out there, so... Moving on. Gwendy's Schizophrenic Identity Crisis This story flashes forward to Gwendy's adulthood, and she is perhaps a little... too accomplished. She's an award-winning author, a successful politician, remarkably gorgeous and likable and just so very perfect in every possible way, and it's, it's kind of obnoxious. 
Perhaps I just like relatable characters that have qualities I can identify with, but it was as if Chismar wanted Gwendy to be everything good all at once when he should have maybe just picked a lane and stuck with it. But it's not just Gwendy that is presented as, or perhaps forced into, this multifaceted full package. The story itself suffers from trying to be too many things in short succession, and a number of the storylines dissolve entirely before ever being fully developed. Gwendy's magic feather is about politics, and Gwendy's rise to office, and then it's not. The political angle is nearly abandoned, or is at the very least inconsequential to the majority of the story. Then it's seemingly going to be about Gwendy's relationship to and with a few characters we are introduced to early on in the story, and then it's not. Chismar develops characters who appear to be influential, and he gives us the impression they will play an important role or be developed further, but they're just not. After the first few chapters, they are forgotten, and it feels not only like a missed opportunity, but simultaneously like unnecessary filler that never really needed to be here in the first place. Then the story has a heartwarming return of the hometown hero, small town hallmark movie vibe. Gwendy reunites with high school friends, spends time with her loving parents, visits the local bookstore, and attends the town's holiday gatherings while drinking hot cocoa and reconnecting with the quaintness of small town rural America. But that, fortunately, doesn't last long either. And in its final leg, Wendy's Magic Feather is a true crime style Castle Rock murder mystery. Chismar is sure to include a number of familiar names and characters from the Castle Rock universe. He ties in and mentions several occurrences and instances from the Castle Rock lore, and it's clear that Chismar himself is a constant reader with an intimate knowledge of King's bibliography and that he may have had some assistance from King himself, as well as one of his other editors, to ensure he got the names, timeline, and Castle Rock history correct. The issue being, by the time this kidnapping murder mystery thread becomes the focal point of the story, there is no time left to develop the angle or explore the nature of the villain, or, or rather, there was plenty of time. It's a book, after all, and this part of the story easily could have been extended and expanded on, but Chismark didn't bother to do that, and it was unfortunately detrimental to the ending of the story and to the story overall. Chismar does manage to take the Castle Rock angle a step further, however, and in the last third of the story, it kind of becomes the dead zone. Wendy suddenly has the same abilities of Johnny Smith, the protagonist of the dead zone, and and when she comes into physical contact with certain individuals, she gets mental flashes of their deep, dark secrets. This revelation comes out of nowhere and mostly feels like a convenient way to wrap things up rather than a clever homage to the first King novel to be set in Castle Rock. This had the potential to be cool, granted in the most fan y of ways, but as is the case with everything else in this story, there was no build-up or development. What bothered me the most was who the villain turned out to be. We are not introduced to the character at any point during the story until Gwendy has a chance encounter with them and she just can see that he is the bad guy. There, there was no build-up, no character development, no clever crime-solving skills involved or employed, no misleading or gotcha moments that makes us look left while Chismar hits us with the right. Gwendy just has cognitive clairvoyant powers now, and she runs into the bad guy and solves the mystery. It's a weak, disappointing resolution. Not to mention the fact that the button box is largely forgotten throughout the story and frankly could be removed from the story altogether with little, if any, notable difference in regards to the greater story arc. Final thoughts. I didn't like this story a whole lot, if you couldn't tell. There were a lot of good ideas that simply weren't developed enough, and there were a lot of not-so-great ideas that shouldn't have made it beyond the three editors. Chismar submitted it, submitted it, submitted it, his initial manuscript too. I'm not sure what happened, but apparently no one was willing to tell Chismar the hard truth that this book either needed to be several hundred pages longer or cut down to just a short story. 
It's fair to say the general consensus was not a favorable one, and to be clear, I didn't know that the book had met with so much negative criticism prior to reading the story. I went in with no knowledge of what other folks thought of the book, but I found that I just happened to agree with a lot of what the critics were saying while I was researching for this video, and I'm afraid that if nearly everyone has the same criticisms, they are likely not unfounded. I've had Chismar's novel Chasing the Boogeyman sitting on my shelf since Christmas, and that novel has gotten a reasonable amount of critical acclaim, so while I'm still planning to read it, I admittedly am somewhat less excited about it than I was prior to reading Gwendy's Magic Feather. Next week, I'll be taking a look at the third and final book of the trilogy, Gwendy's Final Task, which sees King return to the fold for the conclusion of the Gwendy stories. I've already read the book, and well, I have some thoughts on this one that aren't exactly what I'd call favorable, but it's certainly better than Magic Feather, so there's that. New videos drop on this channel every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so dare to keep kids off drugs and click the subscriber bell to get notifications. Okay, goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King pretty pleased with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle, and this has been a great undertaking.